Although I do have to admit, I read The Rose of Versailles for the first time um, when I was researching all of this and yeah. writing about it. So I was already an adult. You know, I, I wasn't reading it when I was in the target age range, which right, is right. You know, <laughs> mid-teens. Um, um, but even reading it as an adult, uh, I got so caught up in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a moment where I was like, oh, no, <laughs> I don't know back. if I can write about this objectively enough. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Hey, welcome to Japan Station. My name is Tony Vega. All right, so episode eight. Yeah, almost up to 10. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, normally I give a quick news update, but there's not that much new stuff going on. Uh, Japan Station is now on TuneIn. So aside from Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Stitcher, you can now get the show on TuneIn. Uh, again, as I always say, rate, review, and subscribe. That really, really helps people find the show. So just keep that in mind, you know, when you get a chance, go ahead, type that up. I would really appreciate it. So my guest today is Dr. Deborah Shamoon. So she is an associate professor in the Department of Japanese Studies at the National University of Singapore. She is also the author of a book called Passionate Friendship. Now, in Passionate Friendship, Deborah delves into the history of girls' culture in Japan. So she specifically focuses on the shoujo, right? So... If you've heard of shoujo manga, which we talk about today a lot, <laughs> uh, then you're familiar with that term. Now, shoujo often gets translated as girl, but it's quite a bit more complicated than that. It's a term that seems to have emerged in the Meiji period around there, or at least that's when it really took off. Uh, and there's plenty of interesting reasons why that is, but shoujo kind of refers to girls in their teens, right? Not quite adults, not quite fully children. Uh, and it's a category that wasn't really around in any significant way until the Meiji period, when Japan began to modernize, so to speak, or industrialize, perhaps that's a better word. And, well, eventually this whole culture of girls would lead to what we now know as shoujo manga, right? Now, what's shoujo manga? Well, in a way, you could say it's the counterpart of shonen manga. So, like, Dragon Ball and Naruto and all those action shows in Shonen Jump, right? The most popular weekly manga uh, publication in Japan. Those are aimed at boys, okay? Typically. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of girls that like those shows, but they're typically aimed at boys. Shoujo manga, on the other hand, is typically aimed at girls, and it's typically written by girls, and it it's not really action-centric. It's more about, well, romance and feelings and things like that. Now, of course, the genre has evolved over the years, and it's ended up giving us series like Sailor Moon and Cardcaptor Sakura and Magic Knight Ray Earth and, and so many, so many others. So <laughs> it's it's a very interesting topic that, you know, I will be completely honest, and I mentioned, I kind of allude to this in the interview, but, you know, shoujo manga is not something I was super familiar with, but reading this book and getting to talk to Deborah just opened my eyes to this whole world uh, with a fascinating, fascinating history, uh, you know, gender and things like that are just always interesting topics to explore and learn about. And uh, there's a whole fascinating history to the genre itself and what led up to it, this whole culture of girls that uh, emerged in the Meiji period. So I'm going to stop babbling because I don't even know if what I'm saying makes sense. <laughs> and what you really want to listen to is Deborah. Okay. So I'm just going to leave it at that, and let's get on with it, huh? Here's Deborah Shamoon. The next stop is Japan Station. The doors on the right side will open. So it might be a good uh, starting point to talk about the word shoujo, right? Because 
uh, in Japanese, you can say onna no ko, right? That's girl. And then shoujo often just kind of gets translated to girl. But there's actually a lot more going on in that word, right? Yeah, that's correct. So, yeah, this was one of the first things that I w- talked about in the book, that in shoujo is translated as girl in English, but it doesn't really have exactly the same connotation. Uh First of all, it really specifically means a teenage girl. Uh, so someone who is in between childhood and adolescence. Uh, and it also has this connotation of innocence and purity. Uh, and uh, I think also what people don't realize is that it's a modern invention. Uh, the, this category was invented in the Meiji period because that was the first time when there was a space between childhood and adolescence. So previously in Japan, as in other pre-industrial societies, uh, you are a child and then you're an adult and that's it. So, you know, first you are uh, in a dependent position and then uh you become physically mature and you're eligible for marriage. Right. Uh, but with industrialization, there becomes an economic ad- advantage in having a space between childhood and adulthood, a time for longer schooling, uh, to keep kids out of the workforce, uh, prolong education, and to delay marriage into uh, the late teen years or even the early 20s. Uh, and, and so when that happens, then adolescence appears for the first time as a category. And that happens that shift happened in all industrialized societies. And, and in Japan, mm-hmm. that happened in the beginning of the Meiji period when Japan started to industrialize. And so for the first time, you have this category of girls and uh, and then, of course, fears about what they might be doing or uh, how to uh, manage and control them uh, within this mm-hmm. patriarchal society. And so the shoujo starts to appear as a character in uh, fictional representations of young Japanese women in that period. Uh, and at the same time, you have girls uh, of the middle and upper classes who are being sent to a secondary school for the first time. Uh, you know, uh, girls in the Edo period had been educated, but it was often in a, a, a piecemeal or individualized kind of way. Now, for the first time in the Meiji period, you have uh, girls who are attending formal secondary schools. And, and the girls who are attending those schools together, and of course, these are all single sex schools, and they start to form their own culture uh, within that school. Um, and so on the one hand, it's a way for the patriarchal society to control them by keeping them away from boys and not allowing them to date. And, and keeping them within this closed girls' culture. And, and then for the girls themselves who are within that, I, I think um, at least some of them perceived it as a time of freedom and uh, intense friendships that they formed with other girls. And so you start seeing a girls' culture that appears in, that, in those girls' schools in the early 20th century. Right. So – is there somebody that's attributed to that term? Like, is there some place where that f- term first popped up? Oh, the or term shoujo? That... Oh, yeah. oh, my goodness. I don't remember. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm not sure okay. if we can pinpoint it to any one person. But um, before the Meiji period, uh, the word shonen, which literally means like few years or young, was applied equally uh-huh. to boys and girls. It just meant children. Oh. Uh, Interesting. But yeah, nowadays, you I mean, most people know it from shonen manga. Yeah, right? exactly. So, so, I mean, since the Meiji period, sh- then when they started using this word shoujo to specifically mean girls, then shonen mm-hmm. uh, at the same time also came to mean boys and not children in general. And, and there were other terms that were being used in that period as well. I mean, in my book, I use shoujo exclusively to just to try and keep things a bit more simple. Um, but in the early 20th century, I think the word otome was actually more common. Uh, mm. we, and that term often gets translated to maiden uh, because the word otome has fallen out of use in post-war Japan. Right. So now if you say that word, it feels very old fashioned. <laughs> right. <laughs> Huh. So, um, yeah, so around, I guess, what is it, the eight, late 1800s, there was a lot of educational reforms. Yeah. And then uh, that's where kind of the notion of the schoolgirl popped out, mm-hmm. right? Okay. And then it was in that kind of environment where you started seeing what would eventually evolve into manga? Okay. So, mm-hmm. yeah, if we're talking about the development of manga, I mean, really... Manga, the way that 
the ex- industry exists today appeared in post-war Japan. It started to appear in the late 1940s and early 1950s. But the roots of all of these cultures of, uh, of shonen manga, shoujo manga, they begin in the magazine print culture of the early 20th century. So in the 1920s, uh-huh. um, as consumer society is starting to explode in Japan, there's a, a huge explosion in popular magazines. Um, as people are becoming more literate uh, and, and they have more disposable income. And so for the first time, you start to see magazines that are specifically aimed at children. Uh, and so in my book, I talk about uh, these girls' magazines of the 1920s and 30s. Uh, and these magazines were not what we think of as girls' magazines today that are these sort of glossy publications that emphasize fashion uh, right. and movie stars, um, although there was some of that. But really, the magazines were um, literary magazines. So most of the content was serialized novels uh, along with illustrations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they were specifically aimed at girls who were attending these uh, all girls secondary schools uh, because they were the ones whose family had the money to spend on these magazines for them. Uh, and and uh, the magazine that I look at the most closely is Shoujo no Tomo or The Girl's Friend uh, because that one really fostered a uh, atmosphere of creativity and collaboration among the girl readers. And mm. So it wasn't just that uh, the the stories were the most uh, sort of creative and uh, appealing to the girls, or the artwork was the most gorgeous and beautiful, but also that the editor of the magazine really encouraged the girls to participate. And so mm-hmm. he uh, solicited contributions from them. They, in every issue, they have uh, large sections of reader contributions and uh, reader contests. They scouted new talent uh, for um, authors and poets and illustrators among girl readers uh, and, and tried to encourage girls to become uh, contributors to the magazine. And they also mm-hmm. sponsored meetings that happened all around Japan and even in some of the colonies uh, where girls would get together once a month and and, uh, and sort of have these like refined meetings where they would learn about art and uh, expression and things like that. So it was a really an important way for girls to express themselves in a time period when uh, they were subject to tremendous amount of patriarchal control. Uh, and and uh-huh. that and these are all of the things that I see as the roots of shoujo manga. So. Uh, the art style, which emphasized a decorative aesthetic and overemphasized eyes, a really huge eyes, yeah. uh, stories that were all um, uh, single sex love stories. So right. in the pre-war period, girls were not allowed to date. Uh, but in these girls' schools, they developed a culture of what was called s kanke or S relationships. And S stands uh-huh. for sister. And so they were having these... Uh, homosexual relationships uh, with other girls in their schools. Um, uh-huh. But these were not what we think of as as lesbian in the contemporary sense. It was, the idea was right. that you would have kind of a pretend girlfriend while you were in school. <laughs> and, and then once uh-huh. you graduated, then it was expected that that relationship would end and you would go on to an arranged marriage. So it wasn't uh-huh. like this was a, an expression of a an unchanging inner identity um and it was seen as a normal thing for girls to do uh, for hmm. a few years before they went on to get married but anyway so you have all of these novels about girls in love with each other um and then also this very strong uh culture of um collaboration and uh, a reading community and uh uh, girls meeting in uh, in person and then keeping in touch by mail, and, and all of these things we see later on in shoujo manga. So uh, the art style uh, it owes a lot to the illustrators of pre-war girls magazines. Um, the fact that the editors seek uh, new artists from among contributors uh, and the close collaboration uh, among girl readers and then also between uh, fans and the uh, professional artists uh, and, and then also the single sex romance stories, which comes directly from uh, these earlier stories. So uh, in the 1970s, the, the first authors of uh, Boys Love um, looked back at these stories and felt that these stories set in all girls schools were by the seventies seem very old fashioned. Uh, and so to make it new and interesting, they switched it so that it was all boys schools. Huh. Um, so even back then they were using like S like the, 
derived from the English es canque like that? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, so oh, interesting. In uh-huh. in the uh, in the teens and the 1920s, I mean, even before that, uh-huh. uh, schoolgirls developed their own slang, and because their English language was so much a part of their education, a lot of the words come from English. It was a kind of trendy thing, even in the Meiji period, to use loan <laughs> words from English. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder if they had strange T-shirts like they did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, how does that uh, early culture, though, compare to like the boys' side of things, right? Because I assume there were publications kind of geared at boys. They they didn't like have those meetings and stuff like that, like with the girls' magazines. Oh my goodness! I actually haven't researched this in as much detail, so I'm really oh, okay. not sure if they had meetings or not. Um, oh, okay, okay. I I'm not sure if they did, and not all the magazines were doing this. It was really this one magazine, Shoujo. No Tomo mm. and the editor Uchiyama Motoi, who felt very strongly that girls' education mm-hmm. was so important, and who was arranging these meetings. So and mm-hmm. the other girls' magazines weren't doing things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so through that, I guess I remember reading something. It was like a sense of community, right? It was like you were part of this sort of secret world, mm-hmm. and the girls would kind of interact with each other. Yeah, and and then. That would encourage the like reader submissions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So every section in the magazine, I, I, there were many different sections that would appear in each issue, um, and you know varies over time. But uh, a lot of it was uh, reader contributions of various kinds. So some of it was uh, contests, and then the winners of contests would get their work published. Uh, some of it was just a few pages at the back where anybody could mail in something, and then the editors would pick the ones that they liked the best. And, and then there mm-hmm. were big sections at the back that were basically just message boards. Um, and so <laughs> it was a way for girls to communicate directly to each other. Um, and uh-huh. so you'd see a name or, you know, like a, a made up pen name uh, and, and the location and age. And and then there would be a couple of lines of a message. So I think it's really similar to like uh, certain kinds of social media that we see today. You know, we think of this as a new thing, but, you know, people were finding ways to communicate like this long before they were online. And uh, you mentioned that it, it extended like all the way to the colonies, yeah, right? So like what, Manchuria, Taiwan, yeah. like the, what Korea, like uh-huh. those areas? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh. Well, I mean, it was being distributed to... Uh, uh, Japanese people who were living in the colonies. Uh, and mm-hmm. As for how much it was being read by uh, uh, the local populations in those places, I'm not really sure, um, right. mainly because I don't have the language capability to do that kind of research. But I do know that, uh, first of all, in many of those places, uh, particularly in Taiwan and Korea, uh, children were being educated in Japanese, and so they were right. being encouraged to read these things. Uh, and also, there were... Uh, local versions of these same magazines that were being produced. I mean, they had slightly different titles. They weren't just direct translations, but they were trying to, uh, you know, spread Japanese culture by uh, encouraging the publication of similar types of magazines. Mm. Yeah. And like these magazines also... So there was this transition, right, from like the old Japanese style of of, um, literature and writing to like the spoken word style, right? And these Uh magazines were a reflection of that. Is that... Oh, you mean Genbunichi? <laughs> right, Genbunichi, exactly. Oh, that, so I that remember happened like. a bit earlier. Oh, okay, okay. Because yeah. there was like Ukigumo, the novel, yeah, right? That, that was like out... the first novel written in the spoken style, Genbunichi. That's correct. Right? That came out in yeah. the 1880s. Uh, oh, okay. And I do talk about that in my book because I see that as the, the Meiji schoolgirl is the root of this uh, image of the shoujo. Mm-hmm. Uh, but those debates were pretty much settled by around 1900 or so. And the first girls magazine, I believe, was published in 1911. Oh, uh, okay. So, yeah, when these magazines start to appear, those debates are mostly over. Uh, mm-hmm. Although the uh, the schoolgirl style of slang and the the type of language that they use even in writing, uh, it owes a lot to that new uh, merging of oral and written style and of mm-hmm. the. Um, the special slang that uh, women developed that has now become a, a kind of standard female mm-hmm. speech. Right. Huh. Um, okay. So that, you know, literature, the magazines, eventually, that's kind of the roots of what we know now of sho- shoujo manga that arise, uh, came out after the war, 
right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what? Uh, so what exactly constitutes a shoujo manga? And could you like <laughs> give a couple examples of like titles that people might? be aware of? Yeah, sure. Okay, so just to fill in some of the history first. Yeah. Um, so these girls' magazines are heavily censored during World War II, and then there's material mm-hmm. shortages. They can barely publish anything. And they start to disappear in the 1940s. People in the early war years, uh, or early post-war years, people just don't have money to buy things like that. Um, mm-hmm. And so they these literary magazines die out. Uh, and by the 1950s, First of all, girls are no longer being segregated in all girls' schools. Uh, Co-education becomes the norm, uh, even though there are still single-sex schools. Uh, And a lot of the restrictions on uh, what how girls could socialize and interact are lifted, and now dating becomes more normalized. Uh, And and so that whole culture of girls' schools kind of disappears. Uh, And... In the 1950s, we start to see uh, the manga industry take shape the way that it is today. So uh, publishers right. start to uh, appear. Um, the first manga that is being published is aimed at children. Um, uh-huh. It's not until the 1960s that uh, manga starts to be aimed at teenagers. Although, you know, there are magazines that are being aimed at elementary school age girls through the 50s and 60s. Uh, and they carry a mixture of... Uh, novels, illustrated novels, and uh, manga. But by the late 60s, manga is taking over as the most popular form. Uh, mm-hmm. And then uh, in the early 1970s, there's a, what's called a revolution in shoujo manga, where mm-hmm. young women, so uh, women in their late teens and early 20s, really take over the genre as the artists and writers. And these editors, take a, who are adult men, take a very hands-off attitude towards it. They're like, well, if it sells, then whatever, do whatever you want. And they allow <laughs> for really incredible creativity in the stories. And so uh-huh. Uh, the stories go from uh, – they gradually evolve from uh, being kind of simple uh, fairy tale love stories to being uh, deep psychological explorations of the adolescent process uh, mm-hmm. of uh, maturation and really very uh, sophisticated storytelling techniques. And that's also in the early 1970s where you start to see the emergence of boys' love as a genre as mm-hmm. well. So, yeah, so shoujo manga, as we think of it today, uh, including all of the um, art style and the storytelling, it really starts to take shape in the early 1970s. Uh, In terms of what uh, titles people might know, uh, in the English-speaking world, I think the best known is Sailor Moon. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because it was shown on TV in English. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, Sure, yeah. That's actually kind of a genre mixing title. It merged the Super Sentai, Power Rangers, uh, you know, uh, transforming squadron type of genre, which came out of boys' uh, manga and television uh, with shoujo manga aesthetics. So the um, the big eyes, the kind of decorative uh, storytelling, the emphasis on friendship um, Mm -hmm. and uh, adolescent development. Unfortunately, a lot of shoujo manga has not been translated into English. And, mm-hmm. and so it's really not as well known outside of Japan. Um, mm-hmm. In the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, some publishers started translating shoujo manga titles, including Sailor Moon um, and other titles like Fruits Basket um, and things like mm-hmm. that. Uh, mm-hmm. And those started to develop a, a big fan base in the United States. But then um, when uh, Borders Bookstore went out of business and oh, some of the yeah. the big um, translators of shoujo manga, like, uh, was it uh, Tokyo Pop, I think? Oh, yeah, yeah. Tokyo Pop was around. Yeah, yeah when they that. went out of yeah. business, um, the they kind of took the whole shoujo manga fan base down with them. Huh. Uh, and there was no longer a reliable source of translations. And uh, it became a bit more difficult for fans to access this stuff. And, uh, and then unlike in Japan, the, um, Shoujo manga fans in the United States didn't really um, develop a next generation following them. So right. I, we haven't seen as many shoujo titles translated since then, which I think is unfortunate. Hmm. So in the 
what what is there like a point where you can say shoujo manga starts here <laughs> or is there a work that you can say it seems like it's a slow transition but you know for example i remember reading how tezuka osamu is kind of involved in that yeah. but then there's like kind of like maybe he is maybe he isn't like the originator yeah exactly <laughs> like what, what's going on with that yeah so so uh tezuka gets credit for a lot of things you know he's called the yeah, god he of does. manga <laughs> uh, i think some of that was self-promotion some of that was oh, yeah. a promotion by he has a very loyal fan base in Japan. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, he really was an innovator. He was a, he's a really important figure, so I'm not trying to take away from that. Sure. Um, yeah. And part of what was so important about him was not just his own work, but also the fact that he mentored so many people who came along mm-hmm. after him. Um, but yeah, he he's often identified as the father of shoujo manga, and that I think is absolutely not true. Uh, uh-huh. So he wrote this series called Ribo no Kishi. Um, yeah. In the mid 1950s, and okay. uh, literally, it means uh, knight in ribbons, uh, but yeah. it's been translated into English as princess knight. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a, there's several reasons why it's not the start of shoujo manga. I mean, one of the reasons mm-hmm. is that there were a lot of other people writing shoujo manga at the time. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, the fact that this already existed as a genre shows that uh, he was not the first one. Uh, uh-huh. Secondly, um, the one feature of that story that's carried over into later shoujo manga is the aspect of gender switching. Uh-huh. Uh, so part of what was so popular about Ribo no Kishi uh, was the fact that the main character, Sapphire, had the soul or, you know, the kokoro, the heart mm-hmm. of both a boy and a girl. And she switches from male to female attire. Um, and we see that in a lot of other shoujo manga that comes later, um, playing yeah. around with gender roles, uh, um, cross-dressing, uh, gender switching. It became a really powerful way for uh, female artists and writers to critique gender roles. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the story itself is a basically an adventure story. It's not interested in psychological interiority. Uh, it's not a story of adolescent development. Um, it really just, like a lot of Tezuka's manga, it moves from uh, an exciting high point to high point to high point in the action. Uh-huh. Uh, and also in the drawing style, uh, he doesn't have a lot of close-ups on her face, on Sapphire's face, and the way that he draws the eyes, even though they're exaggerated, they're flat and black. They're not, they don't have a lot of highlights in them, which becomes one of the hallmarks of shoujo manga. Mm-hmm. Because he's not interested in the interiority of the character, in her inner uh, psychology. You know, she doesn't really have an inner life. Uh, and, and the reason why Tezuka told the story or told this kind of story is because he was a big fan of the Takarazuka. Okay. Uh, the, the Takarazuka was a all girl or still is it's an all girl theater review um, that is based in outside of Osaka. And uh, it's, it was very close to where Tezuka grew up. And his mother was a huge fan and took him to Takarazuka shows as a child. Uh, and mm-hmm. he has said uh, in interviews quite explicitly that he meant Ribon no Kishi to be an homage or a tribute to the Takarazuka. And that's why he had a character who was both male and female, because the uh, Takarazuka actresses, um, some of them play male roles. Mm-hmm. And the very opening scene where you see Sapphire for the first time, she's singing the theme song of the Takarazuka and the panel is oh. set up like <laughs> uh, the stage uh, or, you know, like a, a play uh, with uh-huh. curtains on the side. So, uh, you know, he was marking it really explicitly um, for his readers at the time as a Takarazuka story. Uh-huh. Huh. Um, so did that work influence anyway the shoujo manga was that gender you know switching thing something that would go on to influence the other works or was that something that was also going on at the time anyway well i'm not really sure to be honest i need to look into this more so i an artist who I didn't write about that much in the book, but who I've gone back and uh, looked at in a lot more detail since then is Mizuno Hideko. Mm-hmm. And she was Ta- Tezuka's protege in the 1950s. Uh, she started, uh, or she entered a reader contest when she was 12 years old and caught his mm-hmm. attention. 
Wow. Uh, and so he started to develop her as a new talent. And by the time she was, I think, 16, he was uh, mm-hmm. arranging for her to debut in professional uh, manga wow. magazines and introducing her <laughs> to artists. Um, uh-huh. And so one of the ways that Tezuka um, cultivated new artists in the 1950s was uh, by having them move all move into an apartment building called the Tokiwaso, which was in Tokyo. Uh, It was kind of an atelier, you know, a a big communal living space uh, where people could live for cheap and then help each other get published. And Mm -hmm. uh, Mizuno moved into Tokiwaso and lived there for several years. And she was the only woman who ever lived there. Mm-hmm. And she um, co-published, uh, co-wrote some things with other Tokiwaso artists like Ishinomori Shotaro, uh, oh, who was another uh-huh. big, big He's, name. He, yeah, he did Power Rangers and Kamen Rider <laughs> exactly. and all that stuff. Yeah, they yeah. worked together. And, and uh-huh. so if you look at their early work, all of them have a really, really similar style to Tezuka. Um, so Tezuka uh-huh. was mentoring uh, Mizuno in those early years. Um, and in the mid-1950s, or I guess late 1950s, uh, Mizuno starts publishing a series. Um, uh, oh no, I'm blanking out on the title. <laughs> it's, in English, it's Silver Petals. Okay. Um, and it is really similar to uh, Ribon no Kishi. Uh-huh. And they're both being published at the same time. And oh. if you look at the first few issues or of Ribon no Kishi, the art style is really different. Um, and then later, uh, Tezuka later went back and rewrote and republished the entire thing and then mm-hmm. wrote sequels, uh, a sequel called, uh, Twin Nights. That's about mm-hmm. the children of, uh, the twin children of Sapphire. And he's uh-huh. publishing that at the same time that Mizuno is publishing her work. Um, mm-hmm. is Gin no Harabira, Silver Petals. Oh, okay. And yeah. uh, the art style suddenly completely changes. And I think that actually Mizuno was influencing Tezuka. Oh. That he had picked up her art style. Uh, and, and so mm-hmm. suddenly you start to see close-ups on the female characters and a lot more detail in their clothing uh, and, and highlights in the eyes and the way that they're drawn. Uh, mm-hmm. So I I don't have a lot of proof on this yet. I really need to go mm-hmm. back and look more at the original manuscripts yeah, that were being published though. at the time. But yeah, I think actually uh, he got his shoujo style from her. Huh. And, um, you know, one of the things that Tezuka is often, or people say that the eyes, right? He looked to Disney for inspiration. Yeah, I know. And he said that but, too. <laughs> it's okay. not true. <laughs> I mean, well, it was partially true. You know, I mean, Disney also had exaggerated eyes. Um, but the fact is that uh, Nakahara Junichi, who is one of the big uh, girls magazine illustrators, um, by the 1930s was already drawing in this recognizable shoujo style with hugely Uh exaggerated eyes with lots of highlights. Uh, And and so the shoujo style comes from him. Uh, Mm. It doesn't come from this flat black exaggerated eye that Tezuka was using that came from Disney. Uh, It was the style with a lot of highlights that comes from Nakahara Junichi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So... Shoujo manga, like, I mean, especially in the past couple decades, it seems like it's become a little more amorphous, like you said with Sailor Moon, how it kind of combines elements. But if you could kind of go to its core and say, like, usually it has these kinds of elements, like, how can you identify a shoujo manga versus a shonen manga? (laughs) Yeah, so... You know, genre cat- categorization always becomes rather tricky, but the way uh-huh. that we usually do it is by the magazine that it's published in. Uh, oh. So these magazines like Ribbon and Nakayoshi and Magareto, they're aimed at very specific demographics. So these are uh, young teenage girls. Uh, I think it's what, like 12 to 16 or so. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are some very distinctive things in the art style and in the uh, narratives. So in the art style, you see the exaggerated eyes. And mm-hmm. the style of drawing the exaggerated eyes changes a lot depending on the artist. Like sometimes they'll have a lot of highlights. Sometimes they're kind of empty without a lot of highlights. But anyway, you know, like really over-exaggerated eyes. And the oh. size of the eyes indicates who the protagonist is. So the, the main oh. character always has the biggest eyes. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and you also see what I call a decorative style. So there's a lot of emphasis on the fashion and the clothing uh, uh-huh. because this matters a lot to the girls who are the readers. Um, right. 
And uh, the story is all about the expression of emotion and interiority. So, Mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of action. So you need Mm -hmm. to visually represent that. Uh, Otherwise, Mm -hmm. it becomes really boring. You just have a lot of talking heads or a lot of text. (laughs) Uh, So to make the visuals really interesting, you have symbolic backgrounds. So flowers, clouds, abstract designs that represent visually the emotions of the main characters. Um, And usually not a very rigid division into panels. So Mm Uh, there can be like a, a three dimensional effect where the uh, the characters spill out of the frames or take up the entire page, or there's a mm-hmm. lot of use of empty space uh, and creating a kind of floating feeling. Uh, mm-hmm. All of this to represent the emotions in a visually interesting way. Um, mm-hmm. And this is in contrast to shonen manga. I know a mm-hmm. lot of shonen manga also has an exaggerated eye, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, in shonen manga, a lot of it is the emphasis on action. And so you're moving right. the action along in an ex- exciting way from frame to frame. Uh, and so there's less emphasis on the interiority of the character. And so mm. that's why you have this different art style. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of narrative, uh, the... I mean, of course, there's a lot of variation, but mm-hmm. at its core, most shoujo manga stories are romances. Uh, and the the heterosexual romances tend to be fairly conservative. Uh, so the kind of classic uh, storyline is a girl who is kind of ordinary and thinks of herself as kind of clumsy and uh, uh, not perfect, you know, a, a relatable kind of character. Right. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and she falls in love with this boy uh, and then she kind of like sacrifices everything to be with him (laughs) you know it's it's a a typical kind of story uh and then at the end you know like the power of love brings them together right Uh, in the um homosexual stories um there's been a lot of uh, variation the uh, Uh the earliest stories that we see from uh hagiomoto and takemiya keiko um they're they they're a bit different than the the way the genre works today, um, mm-hmm. but they're stories of psychological awakening of uh, boys who are uh, developing um, their own personas as d- distinct from their family. So they're learning to distinguish themselves from their families to get over traumatic childhood experiences um, mm-hmm. and to be their own person. Uh, mm-hmm. And the way that they're drawn, they look very feminine. Yeah. Uh, so mm-hmm. they're clearly meant as a stand-in to identi- for the girls to identify with. But the fact that they're boys rather than girls allows for a bit of distance. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's a way for girls to safely explore sexually explicit um, romance stories. Mm-hmm. And the way that boys love our yaoi genre works today, it's become a bit more codified. There's one um, partner who's the uke and one who's the seme. Uh-huh. And so uh, the the dominant partner who's often portrayed as more masculine and the um, the passive partner who is portray- portrayed as more feminine. Um, so it's often a bit more heteronormative in the um, – and in the partnership, uh, although not always, I mean, there, there are, uh, titles that play around with that a bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think one of the, the misconceptions, um, is that all shoujo manga is boys love. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that. Yeah, so, that's really has not boys the case. love is is it's like a subcategory, or has it become its own kind of offshoot? Like, what what it is really it? Really depends on who you ask. Uh, okay. I think of it as a subgenre. Uh, mm-hmm. Other people, other academics who study this, consider it to be a genre in its own right. Um, it just depends on your perspective. Um, okay. But you know, academics are always interested in things that are subversive, and so they think that mm-hmm. boys love is subversive, and so that gets a lot more attention. But actually, if you look at all shoujo manga that's being published, uh, the heterosexual stories are still the majority. Right. So Mm. there's still a lot of interest in uh, in heterosexual stories as well. Um, Some of Mm -hmm. the other ways that the genre has changed is that as the readers have gotten older over the decades, there's been a lot more aimed at older readers as well. Mm-hmm. So shoujo manga actually has a fairly young demographic. Um, and yeah. so there have been, um, other genres that have emerged like Jose, or I think now they call it teens, um, mm-hmm. ladies comics, things that are aimed at older readers. Um, and so there's a lot more mature content as well. Um, right. Shoujo manga often relies on fantasy. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of the uh, the more mature genres like Jose are much more realistic and dealing with um, problems that face uh, young women uh, in their late teens and early 20s today. Mm-hmm. And some of those um, are also much more explicit, right? With yeah. the like sexuality and all that. Yeah, stuff, yeah. Right? I mean, the, uh-huh. the word ladies comics, I think, has become a bit confusing because it, uh-huh. it's been used to mean both... Um, Stories for older readers and also uh, hardcore pornographic <laughs> comics. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and there are both. It's a wide range. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Okay. Um, so let's see. So we have uh, the 50s, the 60s, and then comes the 70s, and one of perhaps like the most uh, iconic. Uh, series, which is the Rose of Versailles, yeah, right? Yeah. So that, that emerges and, uh, that seems to be a really important point in the history. Um, could you, so I actually learned about that show. I, I saw it in Peru, um, yeah. in Spanish and it, it seems to have a pretty good international following, but not like anything whatsoever that I've noticed anything significant in the U.S. or, um, I don't know, probably in English in general. I, I'm, I'm not that sure, but yeah. I know in the U.S. at least you don't really hear much about it. So could you kind of explain like what it is and then its role in, the, in this whole big picture? Sure. So yeah. So the Rose of Versailles is hugely popular and important and everywhere except in English. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> which is really unfortunate. And of uh, course, I mean, it's still really well known and widely read in Japan. It was mm-hmm. translated into um, French and Spanish and Italian. And so it was really popular in Europe and in Latin America um, uh, and very well known. And the only language that it wasn't translated into was English. <laughs> and now I think it's missed its time. Uh, and, yeah. and so it's, you know, the manga came out in the 70s and the and TV anime came out in the 80s. And mm-hmm. now I think it just looks too old fashioned and it will never right. be translated, mm-hmm. uh, which is really unfortunate because it's such an interesting story. Um, mm-hmm. So for people who don't know, uh, mm-hmm. it is it was published between 1972 and 1973. Um, and the uh, author and artist is Ikeda Ryoko. And it's the biography of Marie Antoinette. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it diverges. <laughs> right, it kind of starts that way, but then it kind yeah. of. Mm, yeah. yeah, so Ikeda started out just wanting to tell the story of Marie Antoinette. She had read a biography of Antoinette when she was in school, mm-hmm. and she wanted to tell that story. She was very young when she started writing this in her early uh-huh. 20s, and her uh-huh. editor basically was like, whatever, do whatever you want. <laughs> and, uh, and it's. She invents a fictional character named Oscar, who uh-huh. is a cross-dressed woman. Okay. Uh, and Oscar uh, becomes like the dressed protect- as like a soldier usually, yeah. right? Like she's a soldier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Oscar is the daughter of an aristocratic family uh, mm-hmm. who wanted a boy uh, mm-hmm. and has a girl instead, and so her father raises her to be a boy um, and trains her to be a soldier, and uh, she eventually becomes the head of Marie Antoinette's royal guard. Mm-hmm. And uh, she, even though she's cross-dressed, she's not trying to pass as a man. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows that she's a woman. <laughs> okay. uh, and I think this is what is so appealing about her as a character for girls. She mm-hmm. uh, has all of the agency and power of a man, but she retains all of the feminine characteristics. So she has very long hair. She's drawn in a very feminine way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and she becomes the main character. And the story proceeds through the French Revolution. Uh, and, it, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, it, and it includes the storming of the Bastille. Um, and then, of course, it ends with the execution of Marie Antoinette. Right. Uh, so the story changes a lot <laughs> over the course of its serialization, partly uh-huh. because Ikeda was responding to reader feedback okay. uh, and she was changing the story as she went along. Uh-huh. Um, so it starts out as a kind of standard shoujo romance. Um, and uh, of course the romance can't be between uh, Antoinette and the King of France because right. they have this arranged marriage <laughs> and he was kind of a loser. <laughs> right? He's not appealing. Uh, but in real life, there was this rumor that Antoinette was having an affair with the Swedish count Hans Axel von Fersen. And so in uh-huh. the manga, he becomes her romantic uh, partner. 
Uh-huh. Um, and so this is a kind of standard shoujo romance, uh, and they both retain very um, stereotypical gendered roles mm-hmm. in this romance. And Van Fersen tries to rescue Antoinette at the end, and he's not successful. Um, and so it's a tragic ending. Uh, but as uh, Oscar starts to take over the story, you can see Ikeda kind of wrestling with what to do with his character, and in particular wrestling with how to deal with a romance for her. Yeah. So at first, she pairs up Oscar with a standard S relationship kind of story, where there's this young girl named Rosalie who has a crush on Oscar. And you think that this is going to be a standard kind of thing. But actually, the girl readers really hated this Rosalie character, (laughs) who was supposed to be the stand-in for them. They found her kind of insipid and boring. Uh Um, And so instead, uh, Ikeda ends up matching up uh, Oscar with Andre, who was her childhood companion and who actually had been her servant. Mm -hmm. Um, And once she – you can see that once she decides that that. Andre and Oscar are going to be partners, she changes the way that she draws them Uh, so that they start to resemble each other more and more. mm -hmm. And then we start to get more of the story from Andre's point of view. And he Mm -hmm. becomes the kind of standard feminine character where he's constantly pining for Oscar (laughs) Uh and and following her around and sort of playing second fiddle to her as, you know, she is the one who is taking on this heroic masculine role. Uh-huh. Um, and then actually, I, I know because this hasn't been translated, I will give spoilers, but he ends up being killed. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, and, and then that, again, it is kind of the motivation for her to um, uh, really throw in her lot completely with the revolutionaries. Uh-huh. Uh, and then uh, Oscar also is killed in the storming of the Bastille. Uh-huh. Uh, and at that moment, the when that happens, the readers at the time in the 1970s yeah. went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there were stories of Ikeda getting death threats. Uh-huh. Uh, and the class had to be canceled because all of the girls were crying. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, it was really shocking. And uh-huh. honestly, I can say as a reader, it is a shocking moment. Um, well, like the, the, when you see like the Rose of Versailles, Oscar is the main thing that you see, right? Like yeah. he's kind of, or she, he, I, I she, don't know, yeah. is, she is, is the iconic picture, the iconic image that kind of sticks in your head from most of, I don't know, the imagery, I guess. Yeah. So it's, it's weird that when you find out, cause I, I didn't see the whole thing. I'm not that familiar with the story, but the little that I saw, it seemed like, oh, this is a show about Oscar. <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, it is. Uh-huh. And so, I mean, I have to confess, when I was reading this, um, uh-huh. uh, as I was re- researching this, I knew that Oscar mm-hmm. died. I mean, I knew that basic outline of the story, yeah. but I didn't realize how early in the narrative it happened. Like, I didn't wow. think there was a whole volume after that happened. Uh-huh. And so it happened a lot sooner than I was expecting it. And yeah, it's a it's a really affecting moment when it happens, just because also Ikeda is an incredibly good storyteller and uh amazing artist and so it's a really impactful moment and i can Mm -hmm. see why girls reacted this way yeah Uh, and also she had said in interviews that she was meaning to go on with this story for many many more volumes she kind of got caught up in the politics of the french revolution and she wanted to continue to portray it (laughs) okay i don't think readers (laughs) wanted her to see that huh well (laughs) Yes and no. I mean, readers okay. in the 1970s were a lot more politically engaged than we give uh-huh. them credit for. I mean, this was the tail end of the student movement in Japan. Uh-huh. Uh, and the French Revolution was a big inspiration for the student movement in the 60s. So this actually did matter to them a lot. But hmm. um, yeah, readership fell off sharply after Oscar died. And the editors were <laughs> like, that's it. You got to wrap this up fast. <laughs> so uh-huh. uh, she continues on through the execution of Marie Antoinette, which of course, you know, I mean, the story has to end there if you're telling the, yeah. the biography of Antoinette. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, after Oscar died, everyone was like, oh, my God. And and she gets all of these letters saying, no, please bring her back to life. Surely this can't be the end. (laughs) You know, I mean, Marvel superheroes are not the only ones who never stay dead. Right. I mean, the the readers were definitely expecting Oscar to come back. Uh Um, And actually, I mean, Ikeda kind of did bring her back, um, Uh, even uh, though the main Uh story ends Uh uh, and and she doesn't come back. Then after that... um, uh, several years after that, she, Ikeda started writing what's called gaiden or side uh, stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
I, I think of these as like basically she's writing her own fan fiction. Like <laughs> she goes back and fills in the details and some of the things that had happened earlier. And so it allows uh-huh. her to go back and revisit the story of Oscar and Andre. So, uh-huh. I mean, without bringing her back to life after her death, then she goes back and tells all these other earlier stories about Oscar. So like if you wanted to read more Oscar stories, they're out there. But <laughs> personally, I think they're not as good. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, who who has the biggest eyes then in that story? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing, you know. I, well, OK, so Antoinette has the biggest eyes, absolutely, because she's the most feminine character. They're the most round. Uh-huh. Um, but Oscar is the second big, although because she's a more masculine character, there is a, they're a bit narrow. Uh-huh. Um, but Oscar and Andre, by the end of the story, really look very, very similar. Uh, uh-huh. And Andre's eyes are only slightly smaller. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Oscar has blonde hair and Andre has black hair. And so that's how uh-huh. you can distinguish them. Huh. Um, all right. So what what role did this series did this manga play within the larger history like did it originate like certain tropes or did it was it just kind of the most popular thing within the shoujo manga series or what what Uh, is it that kind of makes this special well the the cross-dressing and the gender switching Mm -hmm. for sure was hugely Mm -hmm. influential um she was not the first one to do it i mean Mm -hmm. obviously uh you know princess knight and ribon no kishi existed long before that Mm -hmm. um uh, she was not the first to have uh, male or masculine main characters. Uh, actually, I think Mizuno Hideko was one of the first um, mm-hmm. with her series Fire that appeared in 1969 mm-hmm. um, that I think also was really influential on the Rose of Versailles. Um, you have a teenage boy who's the main character um, and a kind of glam rock setting in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and a lot of talk about politics. Oh, um, really? And, and but yeah, the the Rose of Versailles, uh, gender switching, uh, reconsidering gender roles, um, having uh, masculine or male main characters, uh, engagement in politics, uh, all of these things are really influential. Mm. Uh, the the politics kind of drops off, I think, unfortunately, because Japan, uh, young people in Japan become much less politically engaged in the 1980s and 1990s. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that doesn't resonate as much as it had in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the gender switching, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, the series Utena, um, in oh, particular, yeah. is really a kind of retelling of uh, the Rose of Versailles. Oh, really? I, I yeah, no oh, yeah, absolutely. Huh. Yeah, it, huh. it really um, draws on the the characters and the themes and conflicts. Yeah, really closely. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so I guess after we kind of touched on this already, but after um, the Rose of Versailles, that's when you kind of start to see more like variety like Sailor Moon and maybe like yeah. Ray Earth and stuff like mm-hmm. that. It starts to kind of branch out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure we can credit Rosa Versailles alone with that. Right. Uh, I think it's just, you know, a lot of uh, writers and artists start bringing in these genre mixing elements. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, who's it? Takeuchi Naoko, the... Um, the writer and artist of Sailor Moon uh-huh. uh, was particularly good at these uh, kind of genre switching things or genre blending. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm kind of curious about, well, how did you get into researching shoujo manga <laughs> and all this sort of thing? Like what, what led up to that? Why did you decide? Cause you're, it's this incredible book that you obviously spent so much time on and you've continued to do research since then on, on this topic. Like what is it that interested you about the specific area? Yeah. So uh, I think a lot of people assume that I grew up reading this stuff and uh-huh. that I started writing it because I was a fan, but that's actually uh-huh. not the case at all. Uh-huh. Uh, so I grew up in the United States um, yeah. and I, I was not exposed to shoujo manga until I was uh, much older. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I was a big fan of the Japanese anime that was being broadcast on US TV in the 70s and 80s. And that was uh-huh. all uh, uh, science fiction shonen right. stuff. So uh, uh, like Star Blazers, which is, was uh, Yamato and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Macross. 
mm-hmm. which was shown in the U.S. as Robotech. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was a big fan of this uh, shonen science fiction stuff. And I started reading comics a lot as a teenager. And I, I read all of the um, early translations of manga that were making it into English um, uh, and a lot of uh, American superhero comics also. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, because of this exposure to manga and anime, I wanted to know more. And so I did a uh, homestay in Japan when I was in high school. And then I decided to um, continue with study of uh, Japanese language and culture in college mm-hmm. um, and then continue on in graduate school. Mm-hmm. Um my main interest was always in literature and film. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when I went to graduate school, I, I specialized in modern Japanese literature. Uh, and so I was really looking pretty much exclusively at literature. Uh, but luckily, my um, MA thesis advisor said, you know, if you, you know, because I said, well, I want to write about um, women authors in Japan, like mm-hmm. Tsushima Yuko. And he's like, oh, that's so boring. Everybody <laughs> talks about them. And there's been uh-huh. so much written about these people, you know, and it's all uh-huh. the same stuff. Um, and I think he was right. I mean, these are areas yeah. that have been kind of overstudied. Um, and he said, you know, if you want to write on manga, you can. And it was like a revelation to me that I could do that uh-huh. and as an academic that I could write about popular culture things. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, and so I was like, you know, I keep hearing that there's this shoujo manga genre, that there's this uh, genre of comics that are by and for women. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd seen a little bit about it, but I said, you know, I really need to find out more about what this is all about. Mm-hmm. And, and so it was at that point um, when I was in graduate school that I started looking more closely at shoujo manga um, mm-hmm. and getting more and more interested in what I saw. Uh, and actually, even as uh, uh, when I was writing my PhD dissertation, mm-hmm. I was not only looking at shoujo manga, I was looking at the shoujo image in general. Uh, so in literature and film uh, and, and the different ways that the, the shoujo has been figured. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and it wasn't until I went to revise my dissertation as a book that I really got into shoujo manga in a lot more detail. And I felt like I kind of understood the genre better. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, as an academic, there, you're always trying to do this balancing act between mm-hmm. finding a topic that is interesting enough to you that you can devote all of this time and energy to it, right. but that is not so close to you personally that mm-hmm. you can't uh, write about it objectively. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I think I found that balance with shoujo manga. I think if I had grown up reading it uh-huh. um, and had felt really deeply invested in it as a genre, I might not have yeah. been able to have enough distance. Huh. Um, although I do have to admit, I read The Rose of Versailles for the first time um, when I was researching all of this and yeah. writing about it. So I was already an adult. You know, I, I wasn't reading it when I was in the target age range, which right, is right. You know, <laughs> mid-teens. Um, uh-huh. But even reading it as an adult, uh, I got so caught up in it. <laughs> and I had a moment where I was like, oh, no, <laughs> I don't know back. if I can write about this objectively enough. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, I, I was able to do that eventually. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, so sorry, just kind of wrapping up. But you you mentioned something there, how you were looking at shoujo in general, kind of in film and literature as well. Yeah. Um, so the this idea of shoujo is still something that's around, right? In, yeah. in kind of current day Japan. And for example, something that I immediately think of when I hear you know, what a shoujo is, it's like idols, for example, right? Yeah. Because there's this kind of like innocent and uh-huh. they're never quite adults until they retire or something like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> is that, is that, I guess, I mean, you're kind of saying yes there, but that's basically like a, an offshoot, a reflection of this idea of the shoujo. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, I think there's two main images of the shoujo. One is, the male gaze, you know, mm-hmm. the, that is created by adult men who are looking at this teenage girl who they find attractive and sexy, but also dangerous and threatening. Uh, and, and so this is what you see coming out of canonical literature uh, and then throughout the 20th century uh, in, in uh, books and films and uh, in, including idol culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And then the other is the image that comes out of girls' culture, which is what we've just been talking about. So the way mm -hmm. that girls see themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in both of these, you see this emphasis on purity and innocence and pure love. Um, but in the, the male gaze version, uh, there's this emphasis on her sexiness and her allure and also on her danger and threat. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in the the girls' version, of course, they don't see themselves that way, right? So right. it's not a sexualized image, uh, and it's not an image of uh, danger or threat. It it more tends to be um, either emphasizing romance or on nostalgia and sadness, mm -hmm. uh, and, which is what you saw in the pre-war girls' magazines, because these relationships were always doomed to end when girls graduated from school. Mm -hmm. uh, and then their shoujo years were over and then they were going to have to completely subordinate themselves to their husbands and children. And they would, you know, basically give up their identity. Uh -huh. hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah you, I mean, you do still see this. So th even things like idol culture, I think, is kind of a mix um, because you have these idols that are aimed at men, uh, you know, and so they're emphasizing the sexiness. But then uh, you also have idols that are aimed at girls. Yeah. Um, and I think also the the boy, the, you know, the boy bands, uh, a lot of that draws its inspiration from the aesthetics of shoujo manga. The, Absolutely. The kind yeah, of, like, like the beautiful boys, right? Yeah, like, what girls yeah. want to see. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's very interesting because it's like that side of things. It's almost paradoxical, right? Because you know, they're supposed to be these innocent sort of girls. But then, you know, a lot of times what you see with AKB48 is this like commercialization of like sexualization, I guess yeah. you'd say, right? And it's, oh, yeah, it's... absolutely. And that's nothing new. I mean, that's been mm -hmm. around since, you know, since the late 19th century, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. hmm. Very interesting. Um Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> I think you. we covered a lot of ground. I think it's very interesting <laughs> stuff. Um, and I, I definitely learned a lot from reading that book that I, I had no idea about. Like I said, I just kind of stumbled across some of these shows at some point, And I didn't know kind of all the history behind it. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. This was really fun. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for coming on. Yeah, no problem. That was a long episode. <laughs> But in the best possible way, um, I think that might have been the longest episode that I've ever recorded for the show. Uh, but there's just so much to talk about. Like, I could have kept going on for twice as long because I think you probably noticed right at the end, I snuck one last question in about idols. And that seems like it could have been its own, I don't know, 30 minute conversation at least. Uh, but yeah, I didn't want to go on for too much longer. I, Deborah already gave me so much of her time. Uh, but yeah, it was really, really interesting stuff. Like the whole thing about Osamu Tezuka drawing on Takarazuka, the women's theater. Like that was really interesting. I, I had no idea about that and so much other stuff. So hopefully you had a good time and you enjoyed it. If you're still here, I guess that means you did. <laughs> and uh, one last thing that I really want to highlight is the fact that Deborah, well, she's a great example of, well, you can make a career out of your passion for anime and manga okay so you can do what she did you can become a professor you can teach you can do research and contribute to the world in your own unique way through that interest in anime and manga so keep that in mind if you're of that age and you're wondering like what to do with your life um, you're in college and perhaps you're not sure what to study well maybe in the long run you could do something like what deborah did that's really cool so keep that in mind all right, so if you want to get in touch with me, you can do so via the email, mail at japanstationpodcast.com. And if you want to stay up to date with all the Japan Station news and all the Japan Kyo articles, uh, if you want to find out who the next guest is a little bit ahead of time and all that, go ahead, follow on Facebook at Japan Kyo, on Twitter at Japan Kyo News. Okay, so thank you so much to You Know Me for the opening and closing song. You can find all that information plus things like uh, links to the book today, Passionate Friendship, Deborah's book, uh, over at the show notes, which is japanstationpodcast.com. And you just click on the episode and bam, all the extra stuff is there. As for the next episode, well, it looks really unlikely that I'll be able to release one on February 15th. I'm going to be traveling through uh, Peru and Florida, mainly Peru, though. Uh, so I'm going to be really busy and I probably won't have time to edit. If I can, I'll do it. But like I said, it really doesn't look like I will be able to. The one on March 1st, though, that is quite the episode. It is one of the most emotionally taxing and intense interviews that I've ever conducted. And it is one that I really, 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 really want as many people as possible to listen to. It's an important story that I think people should find out about. 
And it's about the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami and a lot of the tragedy that came out of that. Well, one tragedy in particular that perhaps most of you might not know about, but it is, it's quite intense. So I will be putting out more information on that in the near future, uh, but stay tuned for that March 1st, okay? All right, so that brings episode eight to a close, uh, which means you should go rate, review, and subscribe right now. Yeah, go go leave a review. <laughs> uh, but anyway, thank you so much for listening, and go find your miniature pony. Just do it!